hey, we want to welcome you to Arundel Christian Church today. And today we are excited about worship. We're excited about being here together. And today we will honor God with our voices, with our hands raised high in our lives. So if you would, stand with us. And let's enjoy worship together today. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire. When this nation now change the atmosphere, build your kingdom here. We pray. Come sit.
give me faith. Today we're talking about faith, what that looks like for you, and what it means to have it. This song really kind of puts it in perspective for me. It's a cry out to say, God, take the things away from my sight that are keeping me from trusting you. Soften my heart allow me to open that door to you. This song is a, is, a, is a cry for us to be broken so God can build us up. So when we sing this today, shout out to God the things that's keeping you from really having faith in this walk in our faith is hard. We can't do it by ourselves, and that's why it's so important to understand that we can have faith and trust in our God, even though we can't physically see Him. In the, un in the underworkings of our lives, He is there. He's all around us, but yet we have blinders on sometimes, and we can't see it. So today when we're singing this song, just pray that God chisels away at your heart. And that you just are more open than when you walked in this morning.
How do you know you have faith? Do you guys know what that is? No, no. You, you don't? Okay. Do, oh, a stone. Do, is it something you can smell? No! So, so you can't smell faith? No! No. Okay, sorry. No, I, 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 I thought that was it. something we were doing. What would it smell like if you if you could? It would smell. It would smell like butternut squash. Butternut squash faith. Guess what? What? While you're thinking about that, what if your faith smelled like your shoe? It would smell gross, like a toilet. Yeah, you might want to put some spray on that. It would like smell like squash. poop. If I were you, I would say, don't do that. What? Don't smell faith? No, I would say don't say poops. Faith smells like poop. And then you and you would be in time out. Well, I didn't say that. Well, I would say that if I were you. So, you you telling me I should say that? No, he okay. means if he would like if he was if you were switched to each other. Like, so if I was him? Yeah, and he would be. Ill. How weird would that be? That would be the strain. You would be in a small tiny costume. Be, it would not fit. I don't think I would fit in that very well. If, if you had faith, what would it taste like? Salt. So high cholesterol faith. Should I see my doctor for that? No. So, it won't taste like anything. What about like if it tasted like pizza? Oh, yummy! Yeah, I love pizza. Oh, yeah, so, I, like pizza. I love pizza. I love pizza. So, I love so pizza. you want faith that tastes like it's French? Like macaroni and cheese. Oh, macaroni and cheese. You guys are making me hungry. It's like my favorite meal. What, what's that then? Uh, chocolate uh, ice cream. Uh, yummy, yummy. Yummy. Macaroni and yummy. cheese yummy. and pizza. Did did God make pizza? No, no, we made pizza. Okay. Not, oh, no. not, not the kids, the grown-ups. Okay, so kids don't make pizza. The grown-ups have to put it on, uh, like the stove, and that's no touchy touchy for to kids. Okay. We know that we have faith, right? Check. Check. No fun. And, and, and we realize that check, faith check. might smell like pizza. Check. Well, I'm glad we settled that. And they're our kids. <laughs> Isn't that great? I want to welcome you to Arundel Christian Church. If you haven't guessed it, we're in a sermon series entitled Simple Questions. We all have simple questions, don't we? Mark did a great job last week explaining who created God. Today we're going to talk about faith. We're going to talk about faith and we're going to ask ourselves, how does it work? It's a good question, isn't it? Before we do that, though, I want to stop and I want to thank you so much for your participation in Trunk or Treat. How many of you enjoyed Trunk or Treat? <laughs> that was absolutely amazing. It really, really was. I mean, we had a, a ton of people come through here. Kids had a great time. We had a great time. I don't even know who had the best time. It was either the kids or the parents, but we had a great time. So we just absolutely want to thank you very, very, very much. Couldn't ask for anything better than that. If you're here for the first time, my name is Brian Hamilton. I'm one of the pastors on staff. I may look a little different because I got a haircut. <laughs> Some of you haven't seen this naked lip ever since I've known you. I can't believe it, right? My wife said, hmm, come here, young man. <laughs> so I might keep it off. I'm not really sure yet. Came in the other day, and two of the ladies that do our signing, they said, Brian, you left the stash, because actually I did. I shaved the beard and left the stash. And I said, yeah, I'm going to leave the stash. And they said, really? It's so 90s. So what are you saying? And I'm irrelevant? <laughs> so since I don't want to be irrelevant, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a pledge and I'm going to do the No Shave November. Anybody here with me? <laughs> My wife is too, so we're excited. Anyway. <laughs> No, all, all jokes aside, <laughs> want to welcome you to our simple questions. By the way, next week, we're going we're gonna to change up a little bit. Next week is going to be our family meeting. Our family meeting is where we as a church get together as a family, and we talk about family things. Are you excited? <laughs> family meetings are an opportunity for us to kind of um, 
give you an update as to what's happening behind the scenes, and it also gives you a chance to ask questions. So next week, what we're going to do is this week, if you would like to, um, since there is going to be a family meeting, if I can get that uh, on there. Is that up there? No? Okay, yeah, yeah, good. Sorry about that, Jesse. If you have a question about something that's happening in the church, and it's not a theological question, okay, we're going to be trying to answer those theological questions here in this sermon series, but in a family meeting, what we would like to do is answer some of the questions that you may have. Like, you know, something like, how old is Mark Colburn? Okay. <laughs> People always ask me that. No. Anyway, but if, uh, if you have a question about the church, why we're doing this, where we're headed with that, and why we do this or why we do that, please Either email those questions to info at ACC. You can take in your bulletin the Connect card off of there, and you can write your question on that Connect card. Uh, you can uh, drop it by one of the people at the information de desk. If you have any questions like that, and if we have time to ask or answer them, we'll look at those that this week, and we'll try to answer them next week. Sound like a deal? Good. Well, praise the Lord. Anyway, to start with, I'd like to open with a few scriptures that will provide this important context for you and I to understand how faith works. Because faith can be very complex, can it? Faith can be very abstract. So there are times that it's very difficult for us to really know what faith is and how to live it out. But there are over 300 verses in Scripture, and it seems the entire context of the Bible refers to faith and life with God. So before we do that, let's pray. Father, I want to thank you, Lord, for being our God. There are many questions, and they're not simple questions because they have complex answers. But we trust you, Lord. We have thousands of years of your faithfulness to look back over. But, Father, being human, being people of skepticism and doubt, and sometimes even confusion, we would ask, Lord, that you'd open our minds today that we might understand that you would be able to incite in us this ability to even have more faith. Please help us, Lord, to engage ourselves so that we can be people of faith, God. I want to thank you for this opportunity to be even considered a part of the faith. So strengthen us today as a family. Help us individually, God, and work in our lives in a way that you've never worked before. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now I want to start out with a very familiar passage of Scripture. It's Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. And I just want to read that, that verse to you. Now, faith is being sure of what we want, hope for, convinced of what we do not see. For by it, the people of old received God's commendation. Now, let that sink in here for a moment. Faith is being sure of what we hope for. Anybody here have any hopes for the future? How many have hopes for the present. Well, God addresses both of those, and he says, listen, I want you to have faith. And then he adds a tagline for, by it, faith, the people of old were commended. Now, let me say something about faith. All of us have the capacity for faith. We really, really do. I'm telling you what, we exercise that capacity on a daily basis. We walk over and get a glass out of the cabinet. We walk over and turn the faucet on, put it under there, and we just know water is going to what? Come out. <laughs> and that water is drinkable, isn't it? So we have faith. How many of us board an airline on a, on a, on a plane and we go in there? <laughs> I, I don't knock on the door, although I'd very much like to sometimes, and I'd like to ask the pilot, were you a C student, a B student, or an A student? <laughs> Wouldn't you? But I don't get a chance to ask those questions, but what do I do? I, I go and I sit down and I just assume by faith that what? We're hopefully going to arrive at our destination. So we have the capacity for faith. We eat food at different restaurants with faith, don't we? <laughs> How many of you have uh, had your faith questioned time and time again? <laughs> so we eat. We exercise our faith on a regular basis. I remember when we went to the Dominican Republic, they told us, do not drink the water. I was so thirsty, though, one day. I just took one, one little sip at the very end of the week and actually brushed my teeth in it. And I'm going to tell you, don't drink the water. 
Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> faith, though, we all have the capacity for faith. God realizes that. Now, faith is being sure of what we hope for, being convinced of what we do not see. Now, faith is living in a hope that's so real that it gives absolute assurance. Now, notice the phrase, the people of old were commended because of that. Now, God had told them from the very beginning that they could trust him. I'll give an example. Do you remember the garden scene? God said, listen, I've created all of this for you. you. You can freely eat of any tree in this garden. I mean, just take a good look at all of this. And so man did. He looked at everything. They were like, they were amazed. I mean, there was food there that we probably couldn't even, we couldn't tell you what type of fruits or vegetables were there. They were so abundant. And so he said, you can eat from any tree that you want to in the garden except that one over there. Isn't that funny? We got one prohibition, one prohibition, and what do we do? We just gotta, we just gotta really inquire. We're inquisitive people, aren't we? So he says, "Trust me. The day that you eat of that tree over there, the tree that's referred to as the knowledge of good and evil, because what will happen is, that's metaphorically speaking, you're gonna want to do life on your own. And you're gonna eat from that tree with your own knowledge of what you think is good or what you think is evil for you, because you're gonna want to live independent. When you begin to do that, I'm gonna tell you, you shall surely die, because a life cut off from God is like what." Death. Did that happen? It sure did. And the result of that, we see generationally. How many of you have ever beaten death? Anybody here? <laughs> Some of us may look like we have. <laughs> but, but we have not beaten death. Death is a surety. And also taxes, right? Both of those are a guarantee. We will all die one day. So do you, do you believe that God says what he says and means what he says? I do. And so from that day forward, God said, I'm not going to leave you in the state of sin and death. As a matter of fact, he calls Adam over here. He said, Adam, why did you do this? He said, Eve, why did you do this? Because it was important for God to get an admission of guilt from those folks. Because, see, you and I will not admit Unless we own our sin. He knew it was necessary for them to own their sins. So he got an admission of guilt. He also called the evil one, that supernatural intelligence that you and I fight with on a daily basis. He's a celestial being who has power. No one has to convince us that he exists. Because we see his work and handiwork everywhere, don't we? And so he brings him there and says, because you've done this, I'm going to put enmity between the woman's seed and your seed. The woman's seed will crush your head while you bruise his heel. Now, most scholars say that's the first gospel message because Jesus conquers the serpent. And the only way to kill a serpent is to crush his what? Head. So that was the first gospel message saying that, you know what? Born of a woman, there's going to be one, a Messiah, who's going to take care of all this. And so there were messianic prophecies all throughout Scripture. Think about this. All the way back in Genesis, I'm going to do this. Micah, do you remember Micah? Oh, you, Bethlehem Epaphrathah, though you are small, the smallest of all Judah, out of you I will call my ruler, and he will rule over Israel, whose origins are from old and from ancient times, meaning that he has no beginning and no end, Jesus the Messiah would come. Then he goes on to say, therefore the Lord will give you a sign. The virgin shall give birth to a son and will name him what? Emmanuel. So God would send this redeemer to save us from our sins. And apparently God made this promise over and over and over again throughout scripture there would, this be, there would be a Messiah, a deliverer to take away the sins of the world. He told Israel that. And those who were faithful believed God's promises as vague and as incomplete as most of them were. Because they only had little bits of information. But they put their trust in that information. Isn't that amazing? Now, God doesn't expect us to live by blind faith. He gives us reasonable evidences. We talked about them last week. Mark said, look at the human body. Look at the cosmos. 
Everything has order. There seems to be a purpose for everything. So our faith is in reasonable evidence. It's very reasonable to believe in a creator. Amen? How many of you believe the Ravens are going to (laughs) win? Now that's blind faith because, see, there's no reasonable evidence. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) But, see, (laughs) we have reasonable evidences to believe that God is who he says he would. And so the promises given to the Old Testament saints were so real to them that they actually believed and lived on those promises. Isn't that amazing? The Old Testament has promise after promise reaching far into the future about what God would do simply through Jesus. They simply took God at his word. They were people of faith. It gave them great assurance. And they were convinced of what the future would hold. Now, by the way, nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. God expects you and I both. Every day, you and I have the opportunity to live by faith. We can either take God at his word or we can say, ah, I don't believe it. We can choose to continue to follow his perfect will or we can convince ourselves that we know what's better. How many of you have ever made that decision? Thanks. You're not in bad company. Hebrews 11.6, another important verse we need to be aware of is this one. Now, without faith, it's what? It's impossible. Did you hear that? Without faith, it's what? It's impossible. Without faith, it's impossible to please what? To please God. I just want you to know that. Most people didn't know that. I wasn't aware of that for a long time. I didn't know that it took faith to actually please God. For the one who approaches God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. In simple, faith, listen to this, is the acceptance of God's declaration about who he is and his plan for this earth. And then we live on that basis. It's pretty simple, isn't it? It's God's declaration of who he is and his plan, and we live on that basis. Take a moment to read there in Hebrews chapter 11. You guys are in chapter 11, right? Hebrews chapter 11. He gives us a few examples. Now, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Verse 6, for the one who approaches God must believe. Verse 7, by faith Noah, when he was warned about things not yet seen... With reverent regard, constructed an ark for the deliverance of his family. Now, it never rained. You can read that in Genesis. But Noah went about his business to build this ark. By the way, do you know how long it took to build the ark? Nearly 100 years. Could you imagine that? We think, wow, God, it's been three weeks since I prayed that prayer. How come you haven't come through for me? It took Almost 100 years. Can you imagine every single day going out there and working on this big monumental monstrosity? What are you doing? I'm, I'm building an ark. <laughs> What's an ark? <laughs> well, you'll see. Every day, did it rain? Did it flood? Now, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called out to go to a place he would later receive as an inheritance. And he went out without understanding where he was going. I do that all the time. How about you? (laughs) By faith, he lived as a foreigner in the promised land, as though he were in a foreign country, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob. They were fellow heirs of that same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with firm foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Now, by faith, even though Sarah herself was barren, was way too old to have children, received the ability to procreate because he regarded the one who had given the promise to be trustworthy. In fact, children were fathered by one man, and this one man, as good as dead, Abraham, like the number of the stars of the sky and like the innumerable grains of the sand on the seashore. These all died in faith without receiving the things promised, meaning the Messiah. And future with God. And they welcomed those promises and acknowledged that they were strangers and foreigners on the earth. For those who speak in such a way make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. In fact, if they had been thinking of the land that they had left, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they aspire to a better land that is a heavenly one. 
Now, I don't know about you, but I have hopes, high hopes, of one day being released from the bondage of this world and into the hands of my loving, faithful, compassionate creator. How about you? It's a, that's right. It's a, it's a present promise with a future reality, and we have to live on that. And so on and on, you can read. Please, on your own, read that whole chapter. It's an amazing chapter. So faith is accepting God's declaration of who he is and his precepts and his plans for this life. And we live life based on that knowledge. Notice that the one who has faith, though, must believe that God, what? Exists. And that he, what? Rewards those who seek him. That's the lifestyle part of faith. I live on the basis of how God describes I should live my life because The whole New Testament tells us all kinds of wonderful ways. He's got plans for us on how to conduct our marriages. He has plans for us on how we should conduct relationships. He has plans for us on knowing how to be a parent. He has plans for us knowing how we should work with each other and how if we have a vocation, how we should treat our bosses and how we should treat people around us. He has plans for us on being able to deal with conflict. He has plans for us on knowing how to pray. He has plans for us on knowing how to use our resources and our finances. The question is, do we live by those plans? We say we do. I will begin to see the rewards of God if I conduct myself by faith. I'm telling you, that is the truth. Now I want you to think about this. Jesus Jesus even says, listen, on the very end of time, many people will come to me and say, Lord, Lord. Remember that? He said, Lord, Lord. But they will not enter the kingdom of God, only those who do the will of the Father. But they will say, but Lord, We prophesied in your name. We preached in your name. We taught in your name. We cast out demons, meaning that, you know, we engaged in some supernatural things that would appear that we were conquering evil. And we did did all kinds of amazing, powerful things in your name. And Jesus will say, depart from me, evil worker of iniquity. For I never, what? Yeah, see, you guys are familiar with that verse. That's a scary verse, isn't it? It's one of the verses you go, I don't want to read that. But that's the truth. And the reason why he says evil worker, because what he's saying is that you claim to have faith and you masqueraded your entire life. Because you didn't do anything. Even Satan does the same thing because he believes and trembles. But he doesn't live by faith. Evil worker of iniquity. Wow, that's, that's that's a heavy statement. Because see, that's practical atheism. If we do not live by faith, and that means practice it on a daily basis, we're deceiving ourselves. And we're deceiving those around us. Here's another clear verse that says, now it's clear that no one is justified before God by the law. So, Because there are times that we think, I can appease God if I just do this, I just do that, I just do this A, B, C, D, and I make this list. But he says, no, <laughs> the righteous one will live what? See, we're going to be declared righteous by how we live this life. If we want to be justified, that means just as if you never sinned, we need to be willing to live by what? Faith. Now, that brings me to the next text that we're going to really, really focus on. This is a great text. This is going to be the text in Mark chapter 6. Hopefully, it's a story that you're familiar with. Mark chapter 6. Let me start out by also saying this. In Mark chapter 6, page 1139, if you haven't found it just reach under the chair in front of you and you'll find a bible if not you can maybe just borrow your neighbors and take it home no (laughs) but you can give it back to them but read mark chapter 6 and i'm going to be in this text because i want us to read this but let me start out by saying this if you consider yourself a christian if you consider yourself a child of god if you consider yourself a son or a daughter of christ If you consider yourself a Christ follower, and I'm not saying that you have to be, because I know there are folks here that haven't made that decision yet. Some people think, I'm just not really positive yet. I'm not sure. Got to give me more information, so I'm not assuming that you are. But if you are, if you are, you've been more than just forgiven your sins. You've been called to live a brand new, radically different way of life. And this way of life is called faith. Now, let me say something to you. Faith is not natural. 
Faith is not natural. Doubt is natural. (laughs) Worry is natural. Anxiety is natural. Discouragement is natural. Envying the life of another person is natural. Comparing ourselves to one another is natural. Waking up in the morning from tossing around all night long because you've got this endless list of what ifs is natural. Continuing, continually questioning the goodness of God is natural. But faith is not natural. Now, at one time, I believe it was. Do you remember when you were a kid? Isn't it amazing when you were a kid? My grandfather used to tell me all kinds of things. I'm like, really? And I believed him. Because as a child, you know, you're, you're innocent. You know, hopefully, you know, or maybe I was just dumb. You know, that's where babies come from? Are you serious? I mean, he told me some wild things. It's just like the kindergarten teacher. She was walking around watching all the kids draw drawings. And as she made her way around this whole class, she just kept noticing this one little girl boy, she got her tongue out and everything, you know. She was working diligently. And she said, what are you drawing? She said, I'm drawing God. Honey, no one knows what God looks like. They will when I finish. (laughs) That's faith, isn't it? So perhaps maybe as a child we had faith. But we have learned to become skeptics, haven't we? And every single day there is something attacking our faith all the time. So Mark records for us a story where God's going to take an active role in helping to develop the faith of those whom he loves. Now, remember I said to you at one time as a child you had faith. Or you had the capacity to really have faith and trust God. Jesus comes along later on in Mark chapter 10 and he says this, and I tell you the truth, I tell you the truth, whoever will not receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. Wow, what type of faith does he say that we need to have? Childlike faith, we need to trust in God just like that. And the question I have for you and I'm going to continue to pose to you is do you truly believe That God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. And are you willing to live on that basis with a future reality in mind? Every day the test will come. So Mark gives us this detail because let's read this story in chapter 6 verse 45. Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side to Bethsaida. While he dispersed the crowd. Now after saying goodbye to them, he went to the mountain to pray. Let me tell you the context of this. Jesus is just dealing with a loss in his life. His cousin, John the Baptist, has been beheaded. He tried to get off by himself. Of course, Jesus can't get anywhere by himself because he's so popular. Everybody wants what he has. Gets off by himself. He says to his disciples, let's get away for you know, a while. Just get to an isolated place. I need to decompress. And so... Some people see him heading over to this side of the bank of the river. So they get over there. He's getting ready to pray with them. And all of a sudden, these people show up, a crowd of people. I mean, throngs of people. Now, I love it because Jesus doesn't get exasperated like you and I would. Are you kidding me? All I want to do is get away. He looks out there, and he's very, very compassionate. He said, these guys are like sheep without a shepherd. i got to do something for them. So he considers all of them, and he says to his disciples, he said, listen, we need to do something about this. So Philip comes forward and says, what do you want us to do? Spend all of our money to try to buy him something to eat? And he says, no, you give him something to eat. <laughs> huh? We're out here in an isolated place. He said, yeah, I know. You give him something to eat. Well, how? I don't know. You think maybe here someone's got maybe a lunch. And so they go through the crowd. And they get a few fish and they get a few loaves. Remember that? Now, by the way, people take their lunch with them. They probably took their lunch with them. But you know what? Now, here's the deal. When you're limited in your resources and someone asks you to give up some of those resources, the very first thing you do is do what? I'm not giving them mine. And I wonder how many people they had to go to to say, hey, listen, the Lord needs something here. All right. He can have that one. So out of this huge crowd they come up with, 
Five loaves and two fish. That's a shame, isn't it? Anyway, he takes the five loaves and two fish and prays, Father in heaven, God Almighty. He ends up having the disciples organize this group of people. Remember, they sit down in groups of 50. And he begins to feed them miraculously. Unbelievable. Now the disciples are participating in this. They're watching all this and they're just, you know, handing food out, handing food out, handing food out. And this never ending. As a matter of fact, at the very end, the story says that they picked up 12 baskets full. Now, all of this was a reflection of who Jesus is because Jesus is God in the flesh. He's with the disciples. They're supposed to be picking up on this. There was a long time ago there was a group of people out in the wilderness. It was an isolated place. They didn't have anything to eat. And Moses said, where am I going to get enough food to feed all these people? And God sent them manna and he sent them bread from heaven. The same one's with them, but they just don't get it yet. So that's the background. When evening had come, we'll go back to 646. After saying goodbye to them, he went to the mountain to pray. When evening had come, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. He saw them straining at the oars because the wind was against them. As the night was ending, he came to them walking on the sea. For he wanted to pass by them. And when they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out, Oh! For they were all saw him and were terrified. But immediately he spoke to them, Have courage, it is I. Do not be afraid. And then he went out with them into the boat, and the wind ceased. They were completely astonished. Now, here's this little editorial comment. Because they did not understand about the loaves, but their what? Hearts were hardened. Now, I love that because Mark kind of inserts that out of nowhere. You're thinking, what? You know, all of a sudden they find themselves in a boat. Jesus put them in the boat and they're out there on this raging sea. They freak out. They find themselves all alone. Jesus comes, gets in the boat, everything calms down. And then he says, there was probably a purpose behind this because they still didn't get what they just experienced a day ago. So the disciples find themselves in the midst of a difficult situation. Because, see, there's an objective here, Mark says. He's going to reveal Jesus for who he is. Mark, the writer, is going to do that because Jesus is the promised Messiah. He needs you and I to know that. He's God in the flesh. His other objective was to remind the people that Jesus was starting a community, a community of faith. Get that. Community of faith just like you and me. And his goal was his followers would not just be recipients and beneficiaries of the miracles of the kingdom, but that they would become willing participants in expanding the kingdom. Is there a difference? There is a difference. Those who are there to receive and those who are there to give. So he's proving Jesus' messiahship. So he's got an objective in him. They find themselves in the middle of this difficult sea, headwinds, violent seas. And when you look at the time element, it's late in the morning, probably around 4 in the morning. It's the other translations talk about the third watch. They're rowing. They're getting nowhere. They were beyond their strength, their ability. They were exhausted. This situation seems futile and dangerous. When we read things like this, it's hard for us not to think, what do these guys do to get in this situation? I mean, weren't they thinking? I mean, it was late at night, and they got in the boat themselves. <laughs> they had to be thinking. You know, didn't they call the weather? You know, get their smartphone out and say, hey, listen, what is the weather? You know, did, did they just act independently with reckless regard? Did they stop to consider the danger? But you know what? None of these things were the case. The disciples were in the situation because Jesus told them why. Yeah, he told them to get in the boat. Uh-oh. The problem is not their failure or disobedience. Guess what? Actually, the result of their situation is their obedience. Apparently, they were exactly where Jesus wants them to be. It's the result of their faith in him, and it causes me to ponder this. Here's Jesus full of grace, mercy, compassion, tenderheartedness. Why on earth would Jesus put his disciples in this dilemma, especially when they're going to face this type of difficulty? And I think if we can't answer that question ourselves, 
perhaps we're still in the dark when it comes to understanding how God builds faith. We need to remember Jesus knows us better than we know ourselves. He knows that all of us have a tendency to be independent, self-centered, self-righteous, self-sufficient, including his disciples. So Jesus is going to take them. Jesus will take them where they didn't choose to go on their own in order to produce in them what they could not produce on their own. Do you believe that? So he's going to take them where they didn't choose to go in order to produce in them what they couldn't get on their own. That's a frightening prospect. As his sons and daughters, guess what's going to happen to you and me? Believe me, he's going to take you where you do not choose to go in order to produce what you cannot get on your own. Somehow we have to unlearn some of the skepticisms and doubts that we have earlier learned. It's called grace, the grace of refinement, the grace of uncomfortable grace. Sometimes it's the grace we need in the moment. Listen to this scripture, therefore, so that I would not become arrogant. This is Paul. A thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to trouble me. Uh Uh-oh. Really? God permitted this? So that I would not become arrogant. Because you've got to remember Paul's planning all these churches He's got direct revelation from God. There would be a tendency for him to kind of look at me. I asked the Lord what? Three times. Please, God, take this away from me. You ever pray a prayer like that? My grace, though, is sufficient enough for you. For my power is made perfect in your weakness. You're never going to see who I am unless you have to depend on me in such a way that you're so weak. So then I will boast gladly about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may reside in me. And this last part's tough. Therefore, I am content with weaknesses and with insults, with troubles, with persecutions and difficulties for the sake of Christ. For whenever I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. Wow. Isn't that amazing verse? When we experience difficult times and hardships, we can sometimes misunderstand and misinterpret them as God's disapproval or his inattentiveness or punishment. But perhaps God is up to something, huh? If you're his son, if you're his daughter, and you're going through hard times, be very careful not to misinterpret this as God's inattention or his unfaithfulness because guess what? According to Paul, these were a sure sign of his love and approval because he was building faith in him. Now, I'm not saying this is the only reason for hard times. You ever heard this scripture? And have you forgotten the exhortation addressed to you as sons? My son, I love this. It's a term of endearment. God says it's about you. My son, do not scorn the Lord's discipline or give up when he corrects you. How many of you have ever been tempted to give up? I can't take this anymore. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastises the son he accepts. Endure your suffering as discipline. God's treating you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? Now, in the rest of these verses, included in this group is this. Something that we gloss over really quickly. It says, when he saw them straining at the oars... Because the wind was against them, as the night was ending, he came to them walking on the water. And when they saw him walking on the water, they thought he was a ghost. They cried out. Now, I want you to think about this. Walking on the water. I haven't had much luck with that, have you? I can't even lay on the water. Can you? I mean, I'm serious. I try to swim, and I'm not that much of a swimmer. But perhaps there should be a disclaimer Don't try this at home. This phrase is actually the climactic part of this verse in this story because when you stop and digest this, this is even greater than Nick Walenda over Niagara Falls. Here's a human being, a man walking on water. There can only be one conclusion, one simple conclusion, is this must be the Lord God Almighty because I don't know of anyone who can do that. The God of all creation can do anything with his creation that he chooses, right? Just like he can take fish and loaves and multiply them. Mark's trying to prove that this Jesus of Nazareth is who he claimed to be. God, the promised Messiah. 
And I believe he got his point across. Case closed. Let's bow down and worship him, right? There's also something we need to note. Perhaps Jesus was up to something. If Jesus wanted to remove the difficulty that they faced, if that's all he wanted to do was remove the difficulty he faced, he wouldn't have had to take the walk. He could have just stood from the shore and said, Peace, be still. But he didn't. That tells us that he's not after the problem. He's after the people dealing with the problem. He's going to do something in the heart of those guys. He's not particularly interested in making life easy for them at this moment. He's interested in transforming their hearts and building their trust, which is no easy thing. Just like it's no easy thing in our lives. Think about it in your life. When we face life unexpected moments of difficulty, how do we approach God in prayer? God, I am just so thankful. I've been looking forward to these trials. This is important. I know. It's going to build my strength. It's going to build my faith. It's going to build my commitment. Bring it on, God. I am ready. I've been expecting these things. I've been wondering when you're going to do it. Or do we pray like this? Come on, God. What's up with this? I know you're able. I mean, you can remove this from me. Please, Lord, make it easier on me. Gosh, I'm just trying to serve you. Uh, I tell you what, God, if you do this, I'll really start reading my Bible. I'll serve on the parking lot team. I mean, I mean, I'll even go up to the nursery. I'll even pray more, God. Please just take this away from me. Now, this might sound trite for many of us, but it is so true, isn't it? We'd rather have our comfort more than transformation. We desire a predictable, easy life more than a heart that trusts in God no matter what. I know my attitude stinks, but it's hard to change. You've got to understand, God, I... Have a tendency to avoid difficult people. You've got to understand that, but that's my personality. I know I have the tendency to judge others, but who doesn't? And we, we, we justify our actions. But if we're honest, truly honest, we'd like all of our weeks to be nice and easy, <laughs> predictable. We'd rather not be around messy people. We'd rather have all of our plans, all of our dreams just fall into place. Isn't that the truth? Something happens and we get knocked off of our faith and it doesn't take much. You get caught in traffic. God, I can't believe you're going to be caught in traffic. I can't believe it. I've been telling you what. I've been serving you. I've been giving. I've been, you know, and I, I got an hour delay. You ever do that? The washing machine breaks. I can't believe this either. God, don't you understand? The finances are low and all of a sudden now the washing machine breaks. If you really love me, you'd make the washing machine work. We lose our cell phone. 20 minutes, man. We're halfway into atheism. <laughs> Lord, I can't believe this. How could you let this happen to me? Or someone in church has the audacity to disagree with you. They won't bow down to your always rightness. <laughs> or someone rubs you the wrong way or acts contrary to what your definition of Christianity is and you go ballistic. I'm out of here. God doesn't exist. Listen, it's a delusion. The devil uses people against each other. And here's what happens. There's God, here's this individual, and here's you. And all of a sudden, this person does some type of behavior that makes you angry, and they get between you and God because you know what? You're not going to, by faith, love that person. You're not going to pray for them. You're not going to have anything to do with them. You're going to avoid them. And if you look at proximity value, guess who's closer to God than you are? that person we cannot let anything anything get between us and God I look at Job he lost all of his loved ones and his economy in two or three days and his actions was the Lord gives and the Lord takes blessed be the name of the Lord that's who I want to be. I don't want anything to stand in the way of my God. I don't want anyone to get in between me and God. I'm not going to let them. Jesus enters their distress at this moment because it's designed to change the way they view life, the way they view him, and the way they view themselves. At first, they're not encouraged. They think it's a ghost. 
So that tells us that they're utterly ill-prepared for this moment. Now, they had been witnesses of everything he's been doing, right? He walks on water, and all of a sudden, whoa! We didn't know you could do that. <laughs> oh, no, I could just raise the dead. I could heal the blind. I could heal the lame. I mean, are you kidding me? This is just, this is easy. Watch this one, you know? <laughs> When you go through difficult times or the unexpected, what happens to your heart? Do you become terrified? Where does it immediately go? Do you panic? Do you freak out? Do you exasperate? Do we look at others and say, how come their life is so much better than my life? Do we question God's goodness and love all over again? And we come up with a catalog of questions. So what happens to you and where does your heart go? When things happen, you're not prepared for them. Whether we realize or not, whether we admit it or not, we do a lot of self-talk, don't we? You know what? Mark and I are not the only preachers that speak to you. Each one of us are theologians and each one of us are philosophers, aren't we? How many of you ever engaged in self-talk? You've got to be careful. Don't let people see your lips moving. You know, they'll start to think, uh-oh. Then the deluding voices of the evil one enter in. They cry out to Jesus. It says he went to pass by them. And I really think that was on purpose. So it made them look. And it made them it's not a ghost. That's God. Cry out. And I love the way he responded. He said, Ego emi. Have courage. It is I. And that's the Greek word for I am. It's the same, the same words that Moses heard God say, I am is with you. I am with you. It's I. Don't be afraid. All things are going to be well. It's not the end of the world. Don't freak out. Now, I love it. He could have just said, get out of the boat. I've, I've had it with you guys. You know what? We've worked on this and it doesn't work. You guys are not the guys I'm looking for. He doesn't do that. Aren't you thankful he doesn't do that? He speaks transformative words. It is I. It is I, I am here, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, the one who speaks all things into existence, the one who cannot lie, the one with whom all things are possible, the one who created all things and all, sustains all things by his power, the one who created, the one who's sovereign over every experience that you and I could ever experience. The I am is here. He more or less tells them, I want you to guys to know that it is impossible for you to be completely alone because I am here, even at this hour, that's the lesson they needed to hear. That's the lesson you and I need to hear in life sometimes. If you're a parent, it's one of those years where your kids decide to help you gray. And they rebel and your life is miserable. You need to remind yourself, I'm not alone. In this moment, things are bad. But the I am is with me. If you're facing things in your marriage that you never thought you would face, you got the pain of two people who are at odds at one another all the time with your children in the middle. You need to tell yourself, I am not alone in this. The great I am is with me. If you've lost your job because someone miles away decided the budget for 2014 doesn't include your division, and you're about to lose your job, you begin to wonder, how am I going to tell my wife? How am I going to tell my kids? You can tell them. We're going to make it because the great I am is with us. If you're facing disloyalty in a relationship and you're devastated because this friend whom you regard as a friend and as a Christian, they've hurt you in ways you can't explain. You need to remind yourself, the great I am is with me and I can do all things through him who gives me strength. It's another statement of faith. You can be facing a sickness. It's new and disconcerting. You're losing weight. Your body aches. You have no idea what's happened. You have to remind yourself, hey, my body belongs to the Lord. This is going to happen. I'm not alone. I'm with the great I am. See, we know why Jesus sent his disciples into the storm. Sometimes we need the storm in order to see God. And sometimes it's in the middle of that storm that we begin to see how little faith we truly have. Remember, faith is the acceptance of God's declaration of who he is and his plan for our lives. And when we live on that 
basis in the present. There's a future reality in mind. We need to be careful because we can, we can become astonished like these guys were astonished. But they weren't transformed. Listen to this verse. Paul says, I am sure of this very thing that the one who began a good work in you will perfect it till the day of Jesus Christ. I'm confident because that's a statement of faith. So I want to challenge you this morning. He's never going to give up on us until we trust like he desires us to trust. He's never going to give up on us until we learn how to love like he desires us to love. He's never going to give up on us until we learn to serve the way he desires us to serve. He's never going to give up on us until we give the way he desires us to give. He's never going to give up on us until we pray like he wants us to pray. He's never going to give up on us until we commit to the way he desires us to commit. He's never going to give up on us until we forgive the way he desires us to forgive. On and on I should go. Faith, how does it work? I'll tell you how it works. When we decide to live by it. You know the agony of Gethsemane? Was the pain on the cross. But it was also the pain of Jesus looking up and saying, Father, why have thou forsaken me? Remember that? At that very moment, he was all alone because God had placed all of our sins on him and turned away. Jesus took every aspect of our rejection so as God's child we would never have to experience God turning away from us. There are some of us in this room who are limited in their faith because you're not living your faith the way you should be living it. You're not serving the way you should be serving. You're not giving the way you should be giving. You're not forgiving the way you should be forgiving. There's a ton of things we should be doing. I pray that this morning that you will consider these things and remember how faith works. So exercise it. If there's someone here who needs to make a decision, I pray you'll make a decision. I'll be standing up here. Mark will be up here. There'll be other leaders up here. would love to receive you. Make that decision. Since we're talking about life for life and Jesus gave his life for us, we have a special thing taking place in the cafe this morning. And uh, we have two little girls who suffer with leukemia on a regular basis. And um, Sydney and Faith, both. And uh, we have an opportunity to be the match for them. And if you want to go out there and do a cotton swab, then they can take that result. And maybe you would be the match to be able to be a donor for bone marrow. Maybe this would be the day you'd help out and have enough faith to try something like that. But may God lead us to where he wants to lead us. Amen. May we become more faithful in our walk with him. And may we say, God, bring it on. Because I know your transformation has a purpose. Let's pray. God, I thank you, Lord, for being our Heavenly Father. You're an amazing God. You know just what we need, just when we need it. Thank you for sharing with us your story today with Mark and with these wonderful scriptures we do desire to be people of faith because we know that without faith, it's impossible to please you. Help us, God. Please help us in our faith. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, guys, thank you so much for being here today. Brian, thank you for that message. Um, yeah, great job, man. I just want to reiterate what he said. If you need to make a decision today, if something's tugging at you, you need to talk to someone. Do not ignore that. So please, uh, well, when we dismiss, you can come up front. You can talk to these guys, and you can get some stuff straight today. Um, if you are a first-time guest here, welcome, and uh, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. If you would uh, like to know more about our church uh, and to talk to one of our pastors, we have a thing called ACC at a Glance. If you've got the double doors and a little bit to the left and across the hall, um, we would love to meet you and talk to you and get to know you and how we can be uh, the best church we can for you. Guys, thank you so much for being here today. Have an excellent weekend, and we'll see you next week. <laughs>